Good afternoon. On behalf of our organization, MarketResearch.com, we thank you for joining this session today on the U.S. packaging market. This is Kathy Silverman. Most of you know me and my colleague, Namisha Patel, as global account managers and research specialists serving clients in the packaging industry. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Please feel free to post your questions using the dashboard, and we'll address these near the end of the session. Those we don't get to today will be addressed as follow-up items. I'm now happy to introduce our presenters today. Mike Richardson is a senior industry analyst who has been with Fredonia Group for over 15 years. He currently works on packaging topics, writing studies such as world corrugated boxes, food containers, rigid and flexible, and world pressure sensitive tapes. Mike has appeared on numerous media outlets, both television and radio, including shows such as CBS News Sunday Morning, Good Morning America, and NPR. Daniel Magus is our second presenter, who is the Director of Client Solutions at Fredonia Group. In this role, Daniel is responsible for all custom research engagements within the packaging industry. On that note, I will hand the discussion over to my colleague, Namisha Patel. Thank you, Kathy. Um, good afternoon, all, and good evening for some of you. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, as Kathy mentioned, my name is Namisha Patel, and I'm a senior research specialist here. And um, to kick off our meeting, um, I will just spend a couple of minutes providing a high-level view um, of our organization. Um, and as many of you are aware, the Fredonia Group is now part of MarketResearch.com. And um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with us, um, MarketResearch.com, we are a leading provider of market research. Um, we have, you know, we've been, been in business for over 15 years, and uh, we're headquartered in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, but as far as our research services, you know, we offer multiple different market research solutions to match not only your immediate and short-term needs, but also your long-term and um, ongoing research requirements. And um, how do we accomplish this? Well, uh, we accomplish this through many different platforms, um, our custom research solutions, and also our in-house publishing brands. Um, and I know many of you are already familiar and regular users of our marketresearch.com and um, profound platforms. Um, and these platforms, they offer you know, a variety of cost-effective avenues for you to purchase market research and really stretch your market research dollars. Um, but apart from these services, as you can see on this slide, um, our brands, including the Fredonia Group, also consist of package facts, um, Kellerama information, um, Simba information, and um, which many of these you're already familiar with. Um, and our brands, they do span across different industries from life sciences to the educational markets, um, to the food and beverage, to industrial markets. Um, so we play in a variety of different industries and offer multiple different solutions. Um, but for today, we are focusing on the packaging industry. And so with that said, I will turn it over to Mike Richardson, our um, senior packaging analyst with the Fredoni Group. Thank you, Misha, and good afternoon. I'm Mike Richardson from the Fredonia Group in Cleveland. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today about the packaging market, our studies about that market, and a little about the people who prepare those studies. Three analysts write most of the Fredonia study, and you saw a little bit about them in the slide previous. We work together closely on all the packaging topics and rely on each other's expertise on specifics within the industry. Here are the last dozen or so packaging studies that we published in order to give you an idea of the kinds of topics that we address in our studies. As you can see from the list, uh, we have reports that focus on global markets as well as studies about the U.S. market. Our studies provide both historical data and forecasts and discuss trends affecting demand for specific products in specific markets. U.S. studies typically offer a greater level of in terms of products and markets. World studies generally present product and market information to tw for 20 or 25 of the world's largest economies, although country coverage varies considerably from study to study. As an example, New Zealand, Chile, and Portugal are not specifically analyzed in most of our titles, but they are in a, in a product like World Wine Packaging. In that same vein, 
Here are the topics we're working on currently, as well as a few we'll be starting on shortly. I'm not going to tell anybody here something that they don't know. The packaging industry in the U.S. is a huge industry, about $144 billion in 2015. Paper and plastic account for most of that total, but metal and glass remain important options in many applications. In a developed market like the U.S., growth isn't going to be like China was in the 1990s. In fact, in real terms, annual growth tends to be in the 1% to 2% range in most years. And in a market as well established as the United States, shifts in product mix, at least in terms of the total market, are more likely to be gradual rather than dramatic. This contrasts with a decade or two ago when we saw rapid penetration by plastics in many of the packaging markets. While plastic packaging continues to outpace overall packaging demand, much of the losses for paper, glass, and metal have already occurred in most applications. And shifts now tend to be application-specific more than part of, a, of an industry-wide trend. This is partly due to the fact that most applications do not have a single undisputed best packaging option. A good example of this is egg crates. Expanded polystyrene, molded pulp, and rigid PET are all on the shelf. In fact, at least one well-known egg supplier uses all three types of those cartons, and their website describes both the environmental and performance attributes of each of them. And one doesn't need to be hopelessly cynical to understand that marketing considerations often inform the decision making about which cartons go in front of which consumer demographics. People often refer to the U.S. as a mature market. And if you look at top line growth, that 1% to 2% I mentioned earlier, both in the recent past and in the near term, you really wouldn't be all that far from the truth. But what lies beneath is considerably more dynamic. A number of factors are in play in causing these underlying fluctuations. Sustainability has been an increasingly important topic in recent years, leading to changes in packaging, such as down gauging or light weighting. This has allowed for reduced material consumption and reduced shipping costs due to lighter weights. And this is directly related to cost savings. Of course, cost factors have always been important to the packaging industry, especially in lower margin applications, like many of those that you're involved in. Producers of food, beverages, and other consumer packaged goods also look to packaging to offer benefits to consumers that may sway their purchasing decisions. Product safety features, ease of use, and increased size and format options can all make the difference between a product put in the cart and one left on the shelf. The soft drink market offers an example of how a few of those factors have shifted packaging trends over the years. When I was a kid, almost all the soda I drank came from 16-ounce returnable glass bottles. By the time I was old enough to work in a grocery store, we sold drinks in cans and in two-liter bottles, but returnables still ruled the aisle. A few years later, when I returned from an overseas military tour, those glass bottles were effectively gone from U.S. stores. But a few years ago, when the craft segment emerged and the major producers responded with their own competing products, what did they look to in order to suggest prestige or purity or just simple differentiation or to appeal to a sense of uh, nostalgia? They looked to glass bottles. At the same time, a dramatic new look can also serve to revitalize a quality product whose image has grown a bit too familiar. An example of that can be illustrated by something that happened to a colleague of mine a few years ago. She bought a Coca-Cola in an 8-ounce aluminum bottle. The cashier was captivated by how the bottle looked and asked earnestly, is it any good? That shows that even the most esteemed brands in the world can generate new interest via packaging. Sometimes product reformulations can be a driver of packaging redesign, as we've seen with dishwasher detergent packaging. 
powders in paper in paperboard containers became liquids in plastic containers, and then pre-measured pots were introduced in plastic pails, and now those same pots are often uh, offered in stand-up pouches. Growth for newer packaging options depends on their ability to meet consistently evolving customer needs and preferences. For example, pouches have been among the most, uh, the, the fastest growing packaging products throughout the last decade. While pouches, of course, aren't the, aren't the solution to every packaging challenge, they do hit a number of key marks. And that's enabled pouches to generally outperform the overall packaging market. Pouches may cost more per unit than some competitive packaging formats, but they often offer overall cost reductions in terms of shipping and material usage. These energy and raw material savings offer considerable appeal to a growing segment of the population that include environmental considerations as part of their product selection process. Improved functional features, such as the resealability and portability of pouches, can also appeal to consumers. While improved barrier properties can be attractive to food and beverage processors and other end users. Pouches aren't the only product seeing good growth due to advantages like convenience or overall cost reductions. These are also among the chief selling points for retail ready packaging, a topic that we're studying right now. Corrugated retail ready packaging typically costs more than standard corrugated packaging materials but offer labor and cost savings. While growth for corrugated boxes overall has been comparatively sluggish, demand for retail-ready corrugated materials has been considerably stronger. Another area where we can look at some of those below the total uh, factors at work is in, in the U.S. wine packaging market, particularly in terms of the diversification of size and format options. Demand for wine packaging overall has been about 3% per year for the last decade. Not too bad, but not earth shattering either. However, underlying this overall growth figure has been a dramatic change in how wine is packaged, leading to significant opportunities for newer packaging formats. In 2000, almost all of the wine packaged in the U.S. was in glass bottles. 750 milliliters with a cork stopper because that was the image of what wine was supposed to be. In the global context, most Americans are relatively new to wine consumption, and growth historically here was driven by the prestige wine image and the habit of serving, a, serving it excuse me, on holidays or other special occasions. Now a much larger segment of the population treats wine more as an everyday beverage. 20 years later, Glass bottles are still in the majority, but without the near monopoly that they once had. Other packaging formats, like small plastic bottles, aseptic cartons, metal cans, serving cups, uh, single serving cups that is, and a growing variety of bag and box sizes have all increased their presence. Cost and convenience certainly figure into this shift, as does the general part, uh, general perception, I should say, on the part of millennials that the classic wine experience, wine in a glass bottle sealed with a cork, is less important than it was considered to be by older generations. Also, like most of the packaging market uh, and beverage mar uh, packaging market in particular, the number of package sizes continues to proliferate, with container sizes both larger and smaller than the standard 750 milliliter size, seeing above average growth. And changing consumer preferences can have a ripple effect through the, through the industry. With wine packaging, for example, the gradual move away from 750 milliliter glass bottles has influenced demand for closures, uh, leading to faster growth for products such as plastic dispensing closures used with bag and box containers and threaded plastic screw caps used with aseptic. Uh, cartons. These are the sorts of developments that keep the packaging industry interesting for us to follow. We expect to see the number of packaging options expand, not just for soft drinks and dishwasher detergent and wine, but nearly across the board, 
as packaging will remain a vehicle for new product introductions and the revitalization of brands in need of a makeup. And perhaps this is especially true if the product itself isn't really in need of that kind of makeover. Thank you so much for your time today. At this point, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dan Megas, from our Custom Research Division. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Dan Megas. I'm the Director of Client Solutions for Fredonia Custom Research. And I usually like to start off here just to kind of give you some context on our custom team. Uh, at the top of, of Fredonia, if you will, we have our focus reports. These are relatively pithy uh, takes on uh, industry findings. And they're at a fairly high level. And then uh, we have our full industry studies, uh, of which uh, Mike is a principal author of our packaging-related industry studies. And I think this is the segment where uh, most of the industry really knows us, particularly in the packaging space, for going pretty deep into a number of uh, applications of, of flexible and rigid packaging throughout the, the U.S. and the world. But we also have, at Fredonia, a custom team. And uh, it's my job to kind of work with clients who really want to go deep and have a targeted look at a specific segment or application of a material type, a technology, or an end use market to really understand what's going on to help drive a business strategy and expand uh, a firm's bottom line. The work we do is for hire, it's proprietary. Uh, the good news is that I'm allowed to leverage all the expertise and findings from Mike and Esther and Katie, uh, but unfortunately I don't uh, in the position to really share much back with Mike because the work we do is, is owned by the client and it's designed to be specific to their strategic needs. So we're able to leverage all of uh, the fabulous resources that marketresearch.com and Fredonia have and we really bring that to bear in a very targeted way for you. Uh, I'd like to also mention about half our projects are North America focused and the other half are global. And Fredonia really prides itself on having tremendous in-house language capabilities. About 90% of our employees are based here in Cleveland and we have tremendous language capabilities to really cover the globe. We also are able to leverage a small Beijing office as well as a UK office to reach some of those parts of the world that are a little less accessible accessible to us directly. Uh, and then in a few areas such as Brazil or parts of the Middle East and Africa, we do have established research partners where we want to conduct some primary research in those markets directly for, the, for our clients. Our approach to, to research is really um, uh, kind of laid out in this slide. We spend a tremendous amount of time up front working with our clients to target exactly the type of insight data findings they'll need to uh, plan and uh, uh, execute that market entry strategy to deepen their uh, bottom line, to expand their customer base, to full out a product suite. So we're going to spend a lot of time mapping out what you need. Then we're able to bring, in to bring to bear, again, the baseline knowledge that we have from our industry studies and our constant discussions with different market participants. And then we layer on that targeted primary research through in-depth interviews, survey instruments of different kinds, could be in-store audits at times, to get, again, to target those exact market intelligence gaps that you need to develop your understanding of the value chain, to understand where the market opportunity is, to understand where the margin is. And we bring that together into a so what type of report where you will have clear insight as to how to advance your strategic goals. The types of studies that we do on the custom side, they really run the gamut. In many cases, there are market sizing operations where we're looking at the demand size, trying to segment the market by different material types, end use markets, product segmentation. Other studies are competitively intelligence focused, trying to understand the market share and capacity and competitive landscape of, of an industry. In some cases, we work with clients to develop a framework for understanding the factors that are going to be driving their business over the long run. And in some cases, we're working with our customers to understand more near-term uh, product and attribute features that will help them design new products or expand upon a current product suite. When we look at that voice of the customer type of uh, 
development project. We're trying to look at and zero in on those unmet or undermet needs in the market, understanding uh, your current product's value proposition, their strengths, their weaknesses vis-a-vis -vis some key competitors or alternative uh, packaging types, and really understand the procurement drivers and attributes that are uh, driving certain types of market share gains for different companies and different products uh, currently in the market. Um, I'm not going to go through this entire slide, but I think the important point to mention here is that our custom team has worked on uh, assessments of bulk packaging as well as individual portion-based packaging. We've worked at rigid and flexible plastic and paper applications, trends in material and product usage, uh, certainly uh, ancillary products to packaging such as the caps, enclosures, fitments, labels. Uh, and, and clearly even uh, packaging equipment studies looking at what types of equipment is leading the charge in terms of different uh, substrate layering technologies, etc. So we have a very versatile, very talented uh, custom research team just devoted to the packaging segment and um, I think we have a very good mix of resources for you uh, when uh, you guys have some strategic targeted needs. At this point, I think we've finished a, a big portion of what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, Kathy and Amisha, I think we've had some questions come in, so I'm going to field these a little bit uh, here that you've sent along to us, to, and I think the first one here is for Mike. And we have a question uh, from the industry about, do we have to see any broad trends at Fredonia in terms of packaging preferences and growth between rigid and flexible packaging? Mike? Well, in general, uh, you know, recently flexible packaging in, in plastic has, has outperformed uh, uh, rigid, um, rigid products, although, although I need to qualify that to some extent um, uh, by saying that this is, this is sort of looking at a, at a top line total and overall growth within the market and not really in competitive or sort of head to head settings. Um, uh, so part of that growth may, may be attributable to the mix within um, the industry in terms of, of uh, uh, faster growing products irrespective of packaging, finding um, uh, or, or, or being more reliant on flexible packaging formats than on, um, than on uh, uh, rigid packaging formats, um, especially since, since those are um, often tied more toward the, the center of the store type of uh, applications that generally aren't growing as quickly uh, as the things that are typically on the periphery of a, of, of a store. Um, in terms of paper and board, I think, I think uh, um, in general there's, there's, there's somewhat less disparity um, in the rigid and flexible um, uh, mix um, and, uh, uh, and much of that may be attributable to uh, just sort of the relative usage patterns uh, for products and how the products are growing as opposed to um, uh, real head-to-head -head competition in terms of packaging. Okay. A second question we received here was uh, regarding how we factor in economic trends in general and how has Fredonia accounted for some of the weakening in the global economy. Uh, I will uh, field a little bit of that one. Um, so this, Fredonia has an in-house economics team that really puts together a consensus-oriented uh, forecast for most of the developed uh, economies as well as most of the major developing uh, market economies. And so they will be leveraging some of the, the work of, say, the IMF or World Bank as well as country-specific, maybe a Bank of Japan, um, the, the U.S. Federal Reserve. Uh, as well as some, um, I'd say, private sector prominent um, forecasters as well. So it would be commercial or investment banks in parts of East Asia. It could be Oxford Economics in the case of maybe North America or Europe. And these uh, consensus uh, forecasts are kind of brought together to come up with some overall findings uh, by country, by region as, in terms of economic growth. And then our economic team will then develop individual uh, kind of segment indicators such as maybe manufacturing value added in a certain sector or food and beverage production, uh, particularly relevant to packaging, consumer uh, consumption expenditures, retail spending, et cetera, by country to help inform the teams as they prepare um, their uh, industry studies. Um, Mike, would you like to add anything a little bit on just how some of these factors have come into play in terms of some packaging markets? Well, um, uh, 
there there are there there are disparities in terms of of how economic downturns can affect uh, the packaging market. Um, with some exceptions, of course, um, a lot of consumer packaged goods, you know, the demand for especially food and beverage, but but others as well. Um, uh, demand, again, in, in aggregate terms, is relatively inelastic in, you know, the world's most developed economies. Um, in, in past periods of economic downturn, such as the, the recession um, uh, that ended in, in the U.S. in 2009, um, you know, we've seen shifts to, to private label products, um, uh, which has depressed value demand for CPGs, but um, in terms of, uh, in terms of its, uh, the net effect on packaging, um, it's generally pretty marginal. Uh, typically recessionary periods are, are, are much tougher on um, industries like motor vehicles, industrial equipment, other durable goods, which um, are typically Not as packaging intensive as as uh, food and beverage and other and other CPGs, but uh, but certainly um, in the case of, of of certain segments of the product, bulk packaging, uh, protective packaging, in the case of appliances and motor vehicles, um, uh, you know the the economic downturns can certainly have an effect. We only have time for about one or two more questions. So here we're, uh, when we have one here, is, uh, is there any particular U.S., I think this is in the context of the U.S. market, any end-use markets that are growing particularly quickly these days in driving packaging demand? Well, it, at least in food and beverage, um, uh, you know, the, the, the growth in um, the different segments of the food market are um, uh, not wildly disparate. At least in terms of major um, major food categories, um, although we are expecting somewhat somewhat um, above average growth for for snacks uh, and for and for meat products, uh, and a lot of that growth has to do um, more with uh, convenience related packaging and changes in in um, uh, in what kind of products are, are are on the market? Not necessarily packaging products, but the actual actual food products. Um, for snacks, um, a lot of packaging for um, for food uh, for on the go snacking um, is certainly seeing above average growth. Um, while uh, overall meat consumption is is not really changing that dramatically in the U.S., uh, you know, broader selections of of products like um, uh, prepared or fully cooked products, like um, uh, uh, the packages of, of uh, uh, barbecued pork or pulled pork, um, fully cooked bacon, other kind of convenience-oriented um, uh, prepared foods um, are also are also driving value growth. Well, I think that really takes us uh, to the end. Uh, I'm going to turn it over back to Kathy and Namisha at this point to do a final wrap-up. Thank you so much, Mike and Daniel. I think these questions are just a great reflection of the current issues that folks are wrestling with in the packaging industry today, so thanks for that. Um, we'd like to thank each of you for joining us. We will follow up within the next day or two to answer the questions that were not addressed today and to share the presentation materials with you. Um, thanks again and have a great day.